singing for us this morning. Turn over in your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Well, we've begun a series of messages, and uh, we don't want to have the Grinch spoil our Christmas joy. We want a grace-filled Christmas, amen? We want our Christmas celebrations to be filled with the grace of God. And so we've begun to look at some of the Grinch-like attitudes that can steal our holidays. And there's one Grinch I think we can all readily identify and understand. It is the Grinch of unmet expectations. We've all, you know, probably suffered through that as children. We wanted some special gift. Maybe it was a pony and you got underwear. Uh, you know, as you get older, it may be something else, and you dropped all the hints you could, and you left all the little clues around, you know, things circled in the catalogs, and it didn't come through. Or it may have been a circumstance. Maybe it was as complex as a restored relationship you were hoping during the holidays, maybe some family gathering to reconnect with someone, and that didn't happen. Or maybe it was just you were hoping for a white Christmas. Uh, that happens, it seems like, less and less anymore. But uh, you've, you've been disappointed. You've been let, been let down when it failed to materialize. And after enough years of disillusionment, we simply tend to give up. You know, is that you? I hope not. Have you given up on the whole happy holidays, joy to the world idea? But, you know, if you have, I, I think I have a message for you today. The problem is not in the holiday itself, or even with the weatherman. The problem is in the fact that we have a hope built on wishful thinking. Our hope in this world is often built on wishful thinking. Now, I'm not suggesting that you give up hope, but rather that you discover the sure hope that God provides based on his unfailing promise. The world promotes a hope that urges us to pump up our imagination. In fact, that's the type of Christmas spirit we see promoted in most of the holiday movies at this time of year. You know, if everybody, uh, if enough people will just believe in Santa, then he'll be able to deliver Christmas presents this year. You know, just everybody believe. Let's all sing it out real loud. You know, Santa's coming to town. Everybody just believe hard enough and he'll make it, right? That's the hope of the world. Pump up your imagination. It's a result. Our Christmas joy, I want to tell you this morning, I want to tell you that our Christmas joy is not a product of an active, sanctified imagination. It is a result of an actual event and a sure promise that God entered into our world to be Emmanuel, God with us. That is the confidence that we rest in at this time of the year, the joy that we find is in knowing God is with us. In order to look at this from a biblical standpoint, I want to involve a man that's often overlooked during this season who suffered a seismic blow to his expectations just before the first Christmas. The man's name is Joe. He was just a Ordinary Joe who was looking forward with great anticipation to marrying a wonderful young lady that made his heart skip a beat whenever they were together. However, as the day drew near, he suddenly was caught off guard by a shocking revelation. His fiancée was found to be pregnant, and he knew that it was not his child. Talk about something stealing your joy. Let's take a closer look at Joseph's story and discover how God turned his disappointment around and gave us the greatest hope of joy the world has ever received. We are in Matthew chapter 1, verse number 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. It was like this, different than any other birth that's ever been uh, experienced in this uh, world. When his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph before they came together, before they had relationships, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, 
thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. And he knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. We learn in Matthew's gospel of Joseph's lineage, his background, and uh, in verses 1 through 6 of Matthew. And Matthew also tells us over in Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, that Joseph was a carpenter. In fact, most everything we know about Joseph is written by Matthew. Why the others admit him, I'm not really sure. But Joseph is one of those obscure characters in the Word of God. Uh, in fact, if you will take time to notice, you'll realize that there is not one recorded word from the lips of Joseph in the entire Bible. We told about his character and some other things, but he is never spoken. He's the silent man of Christmas, the quiet man, if you will, of Christmas. Much of what we do know about Joseph is discovered in this first chapter of Matthew. In the first 17 verses, we learn about the patriarchs in his lineage, and then in verse, starting with verse 18, we're informed of the perplexities in his life. Mary was found, discovered, to be with child. How was she discovered? We don't know how it came to light to the community. Maybe it was a growing baby bump. Maybe it was that strange nausea that she was having in the morning. Uh, we don't know what it was that revealed her to those in the community that she was with child, but it became known. And then she must have had a conversation with Joseph and what passed between her and her fiancé. On this discovery, we're not really told in Scripture, but Joseph's struggle over the news pr proves that it really didn't make much sense to him when she told him what was happening in her life. It really did not make sense to him at all. And so in the face of these crushing circumstances that came in Joseph's life, we're told about his character, Joseph's character, in verses 18 and 19. The birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise when his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph before they came together, before they had physical relationship. She was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. We see, first of all, in this explanation that Joseph was a consecrated man. He was just before God. When the Bible says that Joseph was a just man, it just it doesn't mean merely that he was honest. It, in the biblical uh, frame of this, biblical reference to this, it means that he was a man who lived for God. He was justified before God. He was living righteously before God. He was known in the community as a man who was blameless in his life and lived his life of high character. As far as his heart was concerned, he walked by faith in the Lord and walked with integrity before the community. He was a righteous, well-respected man. Probably wouldn't be far off if we were to imagine him as a man who was a pillar in his community. He may have served on the city council or something of that nature because he was so well-respected in his community. Trustworthy businessman and a faithful attendant to Sabbath worship. When it came time for the Sabbath and everybody came to the synagogue, Joseph would be there. You could count on him always being in his place there on a Sabbath day. He was a consecrated man in the eyes of God. He lived his life in a justified, righteous way, but he was also a compassionate man. He was a compassionate. We understand that because he had several options. Once he found out Mary was pregnant and they were a spouse, they were betrothed together. He had a couple of different options open to him to take to avoid the shame and the stigma that came along with that. But he had a caring heart. Now just for a moment, put yourself in Joseph's place. He's betrothed to Mary, which is the same in that culture as a legal marriage, except there is to be no physical intimacy. Uh, a marriage in Jewish uh, culture.
culture consisted of the betrothal, followed by the actual ceremony, which declared publicly that this was husband and wife. And so prior to that time, it was just as binding on Joseph and Mary as if they were already married together. And, but there was a provision if a wife or a spouse was found to be unfaithful. According to the law, Joseph had the option, first of all, of putting Mary to death. She could have been stoned for the, uh, what was discovered about her. And, uh, but Joseph didn't want that. He didn't want that harsh punishment on her. But there was another choice available to him, not quite as severe, but that was to call for a public divorce or to put her away. Now, if he had taken that, it would have left Mary destitute financially, and because of the baby, no man would have wanted to marry her in that community. So she would have basically been left a single mother to raise a child without very much of a financial way to get it done. When Joseph considered these things, the Bible tells us that he was, you know, wrestling with these thoughts in his mind. Instead of acting in anger, he responds in love and compassion towards Mary. He seeks a way to put her away privately without making her a public um, object of shame. So you can see the compassion, the love in this man's heart. You know, it's something for us to consider as we think about how Joseph acted in this moment of deep disappointment. When things are going smoothly, smoothly, we're able to kind of basically put on a front with people, hide some things in our life, but that uh, really is not so easy in a time of crisis when everything begins to turn upside down. How we, re we respond in a crisis reveals a lot about our character. Hard times don't make a person. They reveal the who was Joseph? He was a consecrated, compassionate man. These true truths um, are a lesson for us who want to be used by God. What kind of man does God use? God uses a man who is clean-hearted, and he uses a man who is also tender-hearted. And, of course, those traits are found in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. God had wisely in his omniscience chosen a human man to be a surrogate father for his son who would display those kind of traits in his life and model those in front of Jesus as he grew up there in the carpenter shop, both consecration and compassion. And Jesus would demonstrate those all throughout his life. Along with Joseph's character, we also learn about Joseph's comfort. Here he is in this very troubling time. His mind is just whirling around. He's trying to get uh, things straightened out in his mind. And as he's praying about these things, he's going to bed with this, maybe having prayer before he goes to bed. God sends an angel to deliver a message to him. Only a word from God can bring comfort in times of overwhelming distress. You say, how can I identify with Joseph? Because you've gone through times of disappointment when the rug got pulled out from under you. And God has a word for you. His word is revealed to you through this written word. But to Joseph, he had to send an angel messenger. The angel came with a message of revelation to Joseph to comfort his heart in this very distressing time, this very disappointing time in his life. First of all, we see that there was a revelation of a person person of the Holy Spirit at work in their lives. And while he thought on these things, verse 20 says, Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. You know, Joseph's thinking, I can't understand this. This is impossible. How could she possibly have be pregnant with a child and not have known a man and there not be somebody else involved? Well, with men, these things are impossible. With God, all things are possible. Amen? God's involved in this process. So we may look at some situations and say, I don't understand this. I don't know how this could work out. But God has a way in his word, and we need to look through the word of God to find the answer. And the answer was in the person, the Holy Spirit. The Lord's message to Joseph was designed to help him deal with his, his hurts and his fears. The 
The angel of the Lord told him plainly that this child growing in Mary's womb was the Son of God. You know, he was Christ in her. I read a great illustrate or a great devotion this week. I'll try to share. This is kind of a side track. All right, I'll try to get back on the main road here in just a minute. But I thought this was great. It said, you know, there is a great preposition in the Word of God, which is in. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And when Christ came into Mary, it made all the difference. Amen? And Christ was in her growing until he had to come out. And Christ will be in you and will grow, and eventually he will come out. He will come out in your speech. He will come out in your conduct and your actions. And you know, uh, as you think about that, we can all have a little bit of Mary in us at Christmas time. Every day can be Christmas as Jesus comes out. We deliver Christ to the world through our behavior and through our speech. I thought that was a wonderful thought. I hope it blesses your heart. Now let me get back over onto the main road here. The Lord was calling Joseph to an uh, awesome responsibility. He was going to be the surrogate father to the Messiah. Rebecca sang that song of the Messiah, and he is going to be the surrogate father of the Messiah. What an awesome responsibility that would have to be. So he gave him a revelation of a person. The Holy Spirit was at work in this. The revelation of a purpose. God's purpose was being worked out. And verse 21 says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now, isn't this interesting? This verse tells us the child's gender. This is long before any gender reveal parties at all. We know it's going to be a boy. The child's name and the child's purpose in life. God has a purpose, and his purpose is being carried out. Joseph is told that this child is to be the one that will provide salvation from sin. You know, God's word tells us and gives us uh, clear assurance of what his purpose is in life and his purpose for us. You know, God re recognized the deepest need of man, and on that first Christmas, he sent the answer. The answer is Jesus. Man's deepest need was not financial. If it had been economic, God would have sent a financier or a banker. But God didn't send a banker. Our deepest need is not political. God didn't send a politician. Thank God. He didn't send a politician. Our deepest need is not academic. He didn't send an educator. Though Jesus was a great teacher, that was not his main purpose. Man's deepest need is spiritual. Man's need is to have his sins forgiven. So God sent a Savior into this world. Jesus came to be our Savior, and his purpose was going to be fulfilled in Jesus. Joseph was told that, uh, revealed to Joseph that uh, there was a person involved in all of this. There's a purpose that was being accomplished in all of this. And then he gave a revelation of a plan. God's plan was unfolding and being fulfilled in verses 22 and 23. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted, which being interpreted is God with us. Isaiah had said, Isaiah is the greatest Christmas planner in the Word of God. You want to you want to enjoy Christmas, go back to Isaiah and read Isaiah. He had it all mapped out. And uh, through uh, through the book of Isaiah. But uh, Isaiah had told many, many centuries before that God would, through a virgin, send his son into this world to be our Savior. And this is a fulfillment of that promise. And God has given us other promises in this book that we can believe in. And God will fulfill his plan for this world. Amen? My hope, the blessed hope that every believer has is that Jesus Christ is coming back. That is not wishful thinking. That's not sanctified imagination. That is a confidence based on the sure word of God, the sure promise of God. Jesus said, if I go away, I will come again. I can have hope in that. It's not wish, you know, I hope, I hope, I hope. It's I have a firm confidence 
that Jesus Christ is coming back and his faithfulness word. I will not be disappointed in that. I may not live to see it. It may be my grandchildren that are caught up. But one of these days, Jesus Christ is going to come back and snatch his children out of this world. And you can, you can take that to the bank, so to speak. So Joseph is told that God is working out his eternal purpose in his life, him and Mary, and they are a part of God's plan. You know, God is going to bring to pass all the prophecies concerning the Messiah, and he's going to use Joseph to be a part of it. You know, as we stop and think about it, the message that God was using Joseph in his greater plan for mankind is an encouragement to people like you and I. You know, you look at just a simple village girl and an ordinary Joe. And God used these two people to accomplish the greatest um, deliverance the world had ever seen, is bringing Jesus into this world. And you know, God has called us to be a part of that, his plan as well. We are called, the Bible says in many places, that we as believers are called. I'm called to come. He says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I'm called to come to Jesus. I am called to assemble with other believers, to forsake not the gathering together of myself with others as the manner of some is, so much the more as we see the day approaching. God wants to call us together. And then he calls us to go. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. There's a call for our lives. You're one of, if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're called. You've been called out of the world, and you've been called to go back into the world as a representative of Jesus Christ. We get to be a part of God's plan. How about I cite it? You know, I heard a Evangelist say one time, he said, you know, if you knew what God had planned for your life, what God wanted to do in your life, you'd be more excited than anybody else in this room. You'd be so excited you couldn't wait to get out and see what God would do. Uh, Paul said that I am I'm pursuing after what God got a hold of me for. He said, I press toward this mark. I want to find what God has got a hold of me for. Paul said, I know God had got a hold of my life for a purpose, and I want to discover that purpose for my life. Do you want to discover God's purpose for your life? Get into the Word of God. You begin to obey the Word of God. We see that Joseph had a revelation of a person, a purpose, and a plan. And that brought comfort to his heart in this very troubling time. And as we've observed his character and his comfort, the comfort that God has given to him, you'll not be surprised by Joseph's conduct. What does he do once God makes this revelation to him? Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. When Joseph received his message from God, he altered all of his own plans and put away all his expectation and simply went and did what the Lord said to do. Notice what the Bible says about Joseph's conduct. First of all, he was submissive. He was submissive in his life. Very simply put, Joseph did what the Lord told him to do. You know, he could have, as we said, he was a man probably of uh, considerable standing in his community. He didn't worry so much about what people thought about him. He didn't worry about his standing before men, but he worried about his standing before God. God had required something of him. He was going to obey God no matter what people thought. I'm sure he probably turned it over in his mind. How can I ever explain this to people? As I try to explain it to them, they'll think I'm crazy. Well, Mary is pregnant. You know, she didn't have any kind of relationship with another man. She's pregnant from God. Yeah, right. You know, I can see, he said, people think I'm crazy. You know what? When we tell people that Jesus Christ has come into our life, he's made the difference in our life, they look at us and go, yeah, right. They don't understand. But, you know, we need to be willing to be submissive in humility before God. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You know, I prayed this morning, God, please, I cannot do this this morning without you. I humble myself before God. Say, I cannot preach this message without you. 
you must preach through me. Because if I stand up here and think, boy, I got this. I got this nailed. I'll just fall flat on my face. But God says, I will give you my grace if you'll just humble yourself before me. And so I'm praying that the grace of God overcomes all my limitations, all my weaknesses this morning and gets this message across to your heart. People would have looked at Joseph and not understood at all what he was talking about or believing at all what he was trying to tell them. But Joseph put his pride aside and he said, this is what God has called me to do, so therefore I am going to, I'm going to let people know what God is doing in my life. I'm going to be obedient to him. Like Paul, you and I should be willing to say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul's declaration was that I am all in for Jesus Christ. As much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so it ought to be our heart's desire not to worry about what people are saying, but just to be obedient to God. Without hedging or hesitation, Joseph did that which he was commanded to do. Too often I I get into debates with God. I don't know about you. Maybe I'm all by myself here. But I feel like God's leading me in a certain direction. And, you know, God speaks to me maybe in a service. You need to do this. And I start having a debate with God. God, you just don't understand. You ever told God he didn't understand your situation? Okay, I... From that response, I think I'm not by myself, all right? Too often I try to tell God how it ought to be done. God, it would be better if we did it this way. And God says, son, just do what I'm telling you to do. Amen? Sometimes we need to put aside our preconceived ideas and just trust God for what he's calling us to. Not only was Joseph submissive, he was self-sacrificial. In his life. Verse 25 indicates to us that Joseph was a man who was willing to place the will of the Lord ahead of his own rights and even needs. He said he did not know his wife, he did not have a physical relationship with Mary until after Jesus was born. He said, I don't want any question that what this is the Son of God. I don't want anybody to be able to question whatsoever that this is the Son of God. So he put aside even his own rights so that God could be glorified. That was That's quite a statement from his life. Amen? Put aside those things in his life. There are times when doing God's will is not the easiest nor the most convenient thing to do. But doing his will is always the right thing to do. When we do what he's calling us to, it's always the right thing to do. As I bring this message to a close, I want to challenge you with something. I was prompted to think a little further and deeper into Joseph's confusion and disappointment. I thought finding out your fiancé is pregnant would be joy-stealing enough. Amen? But you know, if you, you carry on and you follow Joseph a little bit further, I, I was reading uh, a Christmas devotion by Max Licato, and uh, he brought this out, and I thought this was really... Interesting. It didn't stop with the discovery of Mary's pregnancy. Can you envision Joseph pacing back and forth outside the stable in Bethlehem, waiting for the delivery of the child? And he's thinking, a stable? For crying out loud, this is the promised Messiah. I've been following God, and here I end up in a stable for my wife to give birth to a child. Joe's probably thinking, as he envisioned, you know, thought about all the thoughts that he had about the birth of the Messiah, this miracle child, he probably thought it's going to be at the temple in Jerusalem, and it'll be in the presence of priests, and an adoring crowd of people will be around. Maybe there'll be a pageant or a parade or something will happen that way. But here he is in a cave that smells like cow dung and sheep urine. This is not the way he had planned it. This is not the way that he wanted to bring God's Son into this world. And yet here they were in this very obscure, uncomfortable place. By the grace of God, 
we have to remember, and we're talking about the grace that overcomes the Grinch. The Grinch is our disappointment, the way things turn out. The grace of God reminds us that his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. What we think is the best, God may have a better idea than ours, even though we may not see it at first. Perhaps today you came to church hoping for something new, a new life. Maybe life's been very disappointing for you and you've had some, some problems in life and you're hoping for an answer to your life. Maybe you expected that when you showed up at church you'd be given a list of rules to live up to and maybe invited to join the church and God would say, well, if Bible Baptist accepts them, I guess I have to too. So, you know, you'd be in. But you know, new life in Christ doesn't come the way most people expect for it to come. For there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. God has a way. That way is Jesus. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I don't know what you're expecting out of Christmas this year, but there's a good chance you're going to get disappointed at some point this year. Take heart. It could just be that God has something planned beyond your wildest imagination. When things are not working out the way you think they should, God has a better plan. Amen? Let's stand together with our heads bowed. Father, I come to you this morning.